Marcus Rummer, director of Roy Williams' Antigone, in conversation with Doreen Blackstock, who played Eunice in Antigone. They're in a black studio with white tape on the floor marked in a grid, with black curtains as a backdrop. Marcus is a tall, bald, middle-aged man with a shaved head. His pronouns are he, him, and he is wearing grey jeans, a black jacket, a patterned shirt, and suede Chelsea boots. Doreen is a black British woman. She's five foot four, and she's wearing a navy blue cotton jumpsuit. It's great to sort of be back and discussing it again because it was a really important piece for us in the way that it really kind of worked and did a really long tour, mm. and particularly playing for young people. And for also for us, when we worked with Roy, he really wanted to extend the, um, you know, the female characters in it, and it's really important. I mean, do you want to tell us a little bit about Eunice and, and her relationship with Creon and, and with uh, Antigone? Yeah. Um, when I first read the play, because I, you know, everybody knows about Antigone, um, and they also know that the mother doesn't really play a huge role in the original piece. So when I was invited to do it, I thought, mm, I'm not quite sure because the mother doesn't do a lot. But when I read the piece, um, it was great. It was great because um, it's the kind of mother that I could identify with. She has a son um, that she wants to steer, you know, in the right direction. Um, controlling, maybe, but for all the good reasons. Her heart's in the right place. One of the things is when we started talking, we'd worked together with Roy on other projects before this, and Roy always wanted to adapt um, Antigone, and so we had the conversation. And he really wanted to tell a story for now around that sort of sense of, of power and corruption, but also the when that young people stand up against the figures of authority, whether that's their parents or anyone in authority. And so for him, he really wants to give voices to Haman, which is in our version, Amon, mm. and that's his son, and to give a real voice with about his relationship with Antigone. And the similarities between that are very similar where Shakespeare would have got his influence from for Romeo and Juliet. Mm. The story of a young couple of, you know, protagonists mm. who are then dealing with the oppression and the kind of stress from their parents and society of wanting to not have them be together. Mm. That was a really key thing. And again, giving that, those female voices, those strong women, a real sense of, of vocal um, input was what we wanted to be able to do. Yeah, I mean, the women are very influential, you know, and mothers are deeply influential, especially with their sons. But we're in a context where, if you like, they're, they're, it's like gang life, you know, it's on road. Um, and that's a different kind of, there's different mothers out there that are dark, that are shady. Um, and, and Eunice doesn't want that for her son. She certainly doesn't want her son to be involved with somebody who has such a colourful past, if you like, um, that, that she feels will impact him, her son, in a, in a really bad way. And also she, she, wants to be, um, she wants to be in a position where she can have an influence on, um, you know, Creole, on how he rules his kingdom, if you like. Um, and that's what I liked about this, because she has a voice. Um, that you don't see in the original. And we've set it in a contemporary space now. And in fact, one of the design influences for it is actually just around the corner from the Theatre Royal Stratford East. It's in the underpass. Yes. Underneath, underneath the road that goes, and underneath there, there are these really big pillars, obviously holding up the road. Yeah. And there's this sort of Greek style amphitheatre space yeah. of this underworld underneath where the world's happening above us. But we, so when Joe Scotcher and I were having a discussion around the design, the idea of this sort of epic space with these big pillars that were there, holding up the road, and the world happened underneath there. Mm. And in fact, you know, in Creo, when we first see him, he comes out of the shadows and he's there, he lives under, he's, he's sort of disheveled and he's mm. broken because of his actions. And, he's, and we find him there in this sort of world while the world is going on around him. And he's forced to live through his nightmares and his dreams, the story that's happened before. Mm. And the way that we looked at uncovering the, the way that the gods work in the kind of the Sophocles text was to have um, security cameras and all seeing cameras and all seeing social media kind of networks that were all seeing and all knowing and letting people know. 
So when Antigone covers up the body of her brother, you know, that's caught on a security camera. That's how they know. So that it's, there's an outseeing eye that's there. And we were able to really play that into the design, which I thought was really useful for us to think about in terms of making this a modern day context, but in this sort of, sort of urban, but every, every town and city has them. The, the bits underneath the flyover or the bits underneath by the bus shelter or, or the, yeah. back of, the back of where the, the loading bay is outside the supermarket. Yeah. Those are the areas where this story played out. Yeah. And it was important for us to, to approach that and to think about it in the context. Yeah, because I think that uh, that helped us as kind of, like you say, to set up the atmosphere, which was cold. Concrete, it's cold. Concrete is dark. It's not inviting. It doesn't give. You know, um, so that lent itself to the story in terms of Creo not giving, Tig not giving, you know, the, the, the you know, Eunice not giving. Nobody wanted to give much, um, and and it's and it and it's shady. Do you know what I mean? It, it's not where anybody else could see, but like you say, where you least expect it, there's a camera that's zooming in and watching. So there's that all-seeing presence of God, if you like. It's there yeah. everywhere. And, and clearly when we started to approach this project um, and working with Roy and working with the team, it was, it was, there were some very you know, um, current stories at the time, particular instances that had happened in, in the States. There was the, um, the character of Michael Brown, who was, who was uh, a young 18-year-old um, uh, person who was shot in the street. And he was left on the streets for four hours and not been able to be touched. And so this, in terms of the story of not having that human dignity of being able to address the body or for Antigone to be able to go and see her brother, we felt very strongly that these stories were happening in our midst. And we wanted to be able to reflect that in, in a way of this story being able to sort of have a, a connection now after you know all those thousands of years from it being written, of it still having a relevance and a resonance now around things that are happening in the news and the way that people respond to them and the way that you know some of that power is is and how that power is used and how young people's response to that and what their actions are was really key to this i think yeah you're right and i think that you know i mean it it it's, it speaks of that thing that young people have that you're supposed to have you know in between the ages of maybe 16 to 25 maybe you know 30 where you can't not do something do you know what I mean? There's an energy within them that says, I've got to, and they may not call it rebellion, but I've got to go out there and do something. I've got to say something. Even though we're living in a, a pandemic, I've got to dawn on a mask. I've got to do something and go out there and tell people that this is not right. Whether it's to cover the body, whether it's to raise the fist, whether it's to be defiant and stand there, but they will find a way to say, we have to do something that's morally right. And people for the first time, especially young people said, today's no more, we're not doing this anymore. Tig says, I don't care. I, I, I'm compelled. There's something within me that says, this is wrong. Morally, it's wrong. I have to cover this body. I have to honor the body. And that echoes everywhere that she's able to convince that even the soldiers, the gods hear her, people hear her, this is a day when things have to change. It's that critical mass point where people say, I've, enough is enough. Just thinking about the rehearsal process, which we, we put together in sort of four weeks, was an exciting time because obviously we were able to generate the characters and to work in that ensemble way with, with the entire company and to build characters and to do things like hot seating and, and sort of character backstory and all of those sorts of um, improvisation and devising around the text, which is always really important to think about what my character's just done before we meet them and yes. to understand their backstory and to understand what motivates them and some of their character influences. It's always been something that I, we, we were able to do and to bring that. Um, any particular sort of thoughts or um, things or recollections from the rehearsal process that you want to sort of have a think about? Um, I think it was remembering um, in rehearsals about um, that process, the hot seating, um, the backstory, um, remembering that Eunice actually came from 
the streets, yeah. you know, um, and didn't want to return there. It's that thing of, you know, when you're uh, working class made good, if you like, you know, once you're in the middle class set, you really don't want to be reminded of where you came from. And I think Eunice had a lot of that. You know, she was now with Creo. She, you know, had fancy clothes and a status, you know, um, that she enjoyed and she didn't want anything to disrupt that. Mm. So when, um, you know, Tig comes along with her ideas, she doesn't want any of that. But in rehearsals, you get to flesh that all out, you know, which is really exciting. And um, the other thing we had in the, in the rehearsal was we had little cameras and we had little, we had little GoPro cameras because we had the idea is we, we did some shot scenes where we filmed some bits and we had some bits of stuff that we could then project. You don't need to do that in the making of the piece, but it enabled us to project some of the ideas of the characters onto the pillars so they could appear as ghosts or they could appear as that. So we played with that a lot as well. Um, the other thing in the, the other thing was we always used sound underneath everything. You remember there's always a soundtrack yes. under all of the work. Yes. It's all because we don't live in a quiet world. So there's always sound. Yeah. And we had yes. sound that was either the interior monologue of the characters. And so we worked with the sound designer, Sandy Nutchins, to create soundscape and score that enabled us to give us the atmosphere of that underworld with traffic yeah, and with sound. Above us yeah. and around us and stuff. And the other thing is that the pillars were really brilliant because mm. they, they enabled us to give that sense of scale. scale. Um, they, and, one of, and two of the pillars down the front were ones that didn't, hadn't been complete. They're like the concrete hadn't been poured in. They started the yeah. metal mesh. Yes. And that's where we put Tig, when, in, in the story, when yeah. Tig gets buried, she gets buried alive. And, he, and, and Creon said, I'm going to dig a really big hole. And she stood in the middle of this cage, yeah. which we could yes. light. And in there we had a camera. And yes. so we could actually get her face. So we could see her trapped in this, in this deep hole. Yeah. But we were able to experiment with that in the rehearsal. Yeah. Um, to be able to sort of find out what it was like for her, because that's horrifying. Yeah, it is horrifying. You know, also um, as a performer, um, we used to be on stage, off stage rather, watching it. So then it feeds in because of that, that scene right at the end, you know, with uh, Creola and Eunice, and it feeds into it. So it was really, it was very interesting watching her in that confined space on the camera, desperately, pleading, being defiant. Well, not... she was pleading to the gods and in a way and she's looking up and of yeah. course the, the gods in our, in our idea was a camera. So yeah. we could then project that. So we had her face yeah. really big and she yeah. was really pleading. Yes, totally and, But she was pleading. trapped in this space, you know, and again, that had a real sort of resonance for mm. what that meant for her as a, as a young woman and what that meant for her being, being oppressed by her, you know, her uncle who, who kind of was, was, was doing this terrible thing to her. Yeah. And also, but still seeing her fire because, mm. because we could see really close up her fire and her passion yeah. of what she, she still didn't give. She still no. believed, she still stuck to her principles, yeah. which was really, really key. And for, for me as a director to be able to see that in a mm. sort of, you know, to have a close up of her face doing that, which was the size of the set yeah. was very powerful. And having all that projection on the set was a very exciting way, you know, to work um, and to and to tell the story and to be in amongst it all. It was exciting. You had some <laughs> amazing jewellery. I did. Which again got unhooked and got thrown onto the floor. Oh, it's delicious. Yes. Because you threw all the wealth and everything that Creo gets because you realise that once your once Eamon has died and you realise that your son has died. This is that like heart. This yeah. is heartbreaking for him. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, and the and the bling, and I thought it was important for me as a character to it, it is that thing of when you come from nothing or scarcity that you suddenly have all of this what you think is wealth, um, and how that you demonstrate that is to you know to adorn yourself with things, with trinkets, with the earrings, with the so you look and feel the part. And I certainly did. There was um, a coat that I wore, and there were particular shoes that I had. And once I stepped into those shoes, I was elevated a couple of inches and it made me feel, you know, you know, regal and, you know, majestic, you know, it was important. And I felt like I was worthy enough to be Creo's wife, you know. So, um, and, and then at the end when all these beautiful things, gold and stuff that he'd given me, 
It didn't matter. My son had gone. It didn't, what mattered? It didn't matter. So it was, it was easy for, it wasn't easy, but it, it had to come from someplace. All of that rage and sorrow and just desperate regret for her to just take it all off and throw it down at his feet. Take it. I don't want it. I don't need it. Your things, is this it? I don't need it. I want my son. And again, in, 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 in this version, of course, is that, we, that giving, giving her that voice, giving Eunice that voice yeah. uh, in, in, in a difference to the Sophocles is, was really powerful mm. because, of, because of what that said and it, what that impact that then had on Creo to realise that he'd lost his son, mm -hmm. he'd lost his future daughter-in-law mm -hmm. and his wife was walking out on him and he was then on his own. Yeah. He was absolutely isolated, which is why yeah. at, the, at the end, and then we go full circle, he starts and he ends on his own. He has nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. He's lost all his power and status. He's yeah. lost everything that held him up there. And he's yeah. now broken and destroyed mm -hmm. and, and living and racked with that, with that guilt and that remorse mm -hmm. of, of having, of, of, of his consequences of his actions. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you use that word power. And I was just trying to think in terms of um, the rehearsal period where I, um, found power with Eunice and that was in this, the intimate moments. So it's the, the intimate moments when she was talking to her son and trying to, you know, um, to convince him, persuade him not to go down the road with Tig. And also when she was talking to Tig, when she was imprisoned, you know, those intimate moments where she, she, um, she exercised her power that she had was in those small places. When Creo and the other were, weren't around, she would just say things from her wisdom of having come from where she'd come from in the streets to where she is now. That's how she would exert her power. And so it really is a story, I think, why it has a universality of story. It's about families. Yeah. And it's about structures and it's about yeah. choices and which, on which path you were going to take. Yeah. and where you might end up. Yeah. Um, and that family that's trying to hold things together through power and fear, yeah. which ultimately sort of crumbles because there's a rebellion against that. Yeah. And that for me is, is, is a really key sort of thing to think about. Antigone is a story that has survived over 2000 years. Yeah. Which proves one thing that for every generation, there is a, another way that we can tell this. Yeah. Because if it hadn't, lasted that length of time, it would have been discarded and no one would yes, know about it. Yes, very true. Because it has universal themes and it has universal, universal themes around, around power, mm -hmm. around possible corruption and around coercion and around rebellion and resistance yeah. and a vocal and a youthful energy mm. to challenge yeah. um, authority. Authority. And yeah. to challenge some of the accepted existing ways of doing things. Yeah. This is a story that has endured that length of time. Mm. And the fact is that there's always a new way to tell it because every generation has still got those young voices coming yeah. through that are saying, no, I think you need to look at this in a different way. Mm. And we don't agree with what you're saying. Mm. And that's one of the powers of this piece. And I think Roy has done a really amazing job yeah. in being able to place it in the now that really gives the opportunity for young people to, to really rise to that challenge and to take that forward yeah. and to retell using this text their version and their response to Antigone yeah. through this particular adaptation. Yeah.